So before the service this morning, I was when I was spending some time with God, just listening to what He was saying. The Lord told me to tell you that remission is for us. That remission is available for us. We have a, a, a warped understanding of sin. And, and whenever we have a warped understanding of sin, what it does is it robs us of being able to walk in what God's called us to walk in. And what the Word of the Lord is uh, for the body of Christ is you are in full remission. And you need to understand that. That there is nothing, there is nothing from your past that can rob you of your future unless you let it. You are in full remission. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 10, it was, uh, it says, enjoy, uh, let, me, let me see, let me back up. It says that we have, uh, well, let me find out where it is now that it said that. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. The offering for sin has been made. When Jesus paid the price, it's complete. And what that provides for us is complete remission. And we need to understand what that feels like to walk in that. Because sin is not something that has any authority to rob you of any place. Not of your presence or of your future. Nothing from your past has authority to rob you of walking in what God's called you to walk in. You are in full remission. And that is available for the complete body of Christ. And we need to understand that so that we can be the body that God has called us to be. We've been talking about the family. We, we started out talking about what it means to seek God. And I know... I want to tell you from the beginning, I know that I am in a room full of people that have a desire to seek God in their life. I know that. I know that I am. But I am going to tell you that that's going to have to cause, that's going to have to require some change in our behavior, some change in what we do. And I'm going to preach about that today, and I want to tell you up front, I need you to love me when it's over as much as you've loved me before. Because this is a hard message. But this is what I believe. I, I'm telling you, it's as hard for me as anybody in the room. If you think I don't struggle as much or worse than anybody in the room, you, you just simply don't know me. Yeah. I do. Man, I do. I, I wear my God. I have to call him and tell him all the time I'm from such a broken place. Because I feel the burden of what God's called us to do so strongly set in front of me. And I believe in it with all of my heart. And yet I doubt me all the time. And I doubt my faithfulness and I doubt my ability. And we have to get to the spot that we move away from that. Yeah. We're going to talk about that today, what it looks like. And so I just want you to understand that, that there are some difficult things in this message. As we look at what church family looks like today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 12. Whenever I talk to people about my favorite picture of the church, people say, oh man, Acts 2. You know, Acts 2 is an amazing thing. But Acts 12 is what I believe is the, is the picture of the ideal church. And I want us to understand that. But as we're turning there, I wanted to say something to you up front. There's a problem that there is a problem in our lives other than the sin issue. We are in full remission. And so at some point, you're just going to have to, listen, get over it. Jesus has. He's gotten over it. So move beyond. And so the sin thing has got to go. But then there's another problem that, that we have. And our problem is in our understanding. The place that we have a problem is we forget to factor into our faith that God is sovereign. That means this. God has the ability and the right to do whatever He wants to do, whenever He wants to do it, and however He wants to do it. He doesn't have to explain it to you. He has the right. It's His, it's his right. And so our life is fully in His right to do whatever He wants to do with it. And we don't understand that. And so whenever we don't understand that, that causes us difficulty in our faith. And when we have difficulty in our faith, we say things like this. Well, God's never late. And that sounds like, 
That sounds like a good, a right, a godly thing to say. God's never late. God wouldn't be late. God's always on time. He's always got the right time. And I will tell you, whenever you, whenever you, and, and I know that there are way godlier, way better preachers than me that say things like that. But I'll tell you, I think that that's problematic to our faith. Because what that does is that takes God and it kind of puts him, locks him into our time scale. And it says that he's kind of obligated to what our needs are. And he has to, he has to meet our needs. And so what that does is it tries to force this great big God into our time scale. And I want to tell you that he's bigger than your time scale. And I want to tell you this. He has the right to be laid in your life if he wants to. No matter how problematic that is for your theology and for mine. He has the right to be late. And if you think that God's never late, I want you to read the first two verses of Acts chapter 12 with me. In this place it says, verse 1 and 2, it says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He killed Herod, killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This is the same James and John, the sons of Zebedee. We know who James and John are. They're, they're brothers that Jesus called. They, we know who their dad is, Zebedee. We even know who Zebedee's wife is in some other places in Scripture. This is a real family. John, John and James, these were real brothers. The Bible calls them Boanginese. Sons of thunder. These were violent men. These were, these were like tough guys. And Jesus knew them. He called them. He walked with them for years. He loved them. He knew their family. So my question, first of all, is this. If God's never, if God's never late, do you think James would say the same thing? Herod cut James' head off. My question to you is, when you come to real difficult things in life like that, what does your theology do with that? What does your theology that says God's never late do when you have to be the pastor to sit down with John and Zebedee and Zebedee's wife and explain what happened to James? As soon as you shrink God down to a small enough size that you're able to explain Him and able to rationalize all the moves of God off in your life, you've just missed out on who God is. He doesn't owe you and I an explanation. And we can't allow our, our thinking or our understanding or our realization, which hear me, I preach on this all the time. I want you to understand God's plan is to prosper you. He has a hope for you. Jesus Christ came to bring you life, not just life average, but life abundant, life to the full. That's what He wants to do for you, with you, in you, through you. His plan for you is amazing, but He doesn't owe you any explanation if it doesn't look the way you think it should. We have to keep God in His place as God in front of us. And we have to go, God, this is what I think. This is what I believe. This is what I desire. But you're too big for me to question, so I'm going to serve you no matter what. Because if we don't, I mean, stay transparent with you. What if we don't? What happens is you start questioning everything. And as the pastor of the church, I go, God, I know that you've called this church to affect this community. I know that you've called us to reach all of the lost people in this area. And I know that you've called us to grow this church. And I know that you've called us to, to bring a retirement home in, to bring a, a children's home in, to, to be able to own, pay for apartments that we can take families in that are struggling and help them get somewhere. I know that you've called us to these things, but you know what I see every day? See bills that it's a struggle as a church to pay. I see, I see seats that I want to be full of people. And if I'm not careful, I let all of these things that I see cause me struggle and difficulty, and I start saying things like, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not the right guy to lead us. And start questioning everything. And I start going, God, maybe I don't have the right stuff. Maybe I don't. And I start questioning all of these things. And what God is doing is He's going, really? Because it doesn't look the way you think it should look, Mark. Now all of a sudden you've got to question everything. 
What about me being God and you just believing that that's enough? Yeah. What about you leading a bunch of people to press in and say, I believe in you, God, and even if it never works out the way that I think it's supposed to work out, it's still worth it. Yeah. I leaned over to Cinder just a minute ago and I said, what if God were to say to you, yes, I'm going to accomplish everything that I've said in front of you as a church, but in order for that to happen, it's going to cost Mark's life. Is it still worth it? If you have to sit there alone, man, we have, as hard as it is, we have to say, yeah, God, you're so worth it. Even if I get to the spot that I can't understand it and things don't work out the way that I think they should, you're still worth it. I still believe in you. That's what this group of people did. Because as we read on in this story, there's some funny parts and there's some great parts, but nowhere in the story can we afford to forget about James. James. And that's not to be a downer, but that's to say, God, even if we lose James, we're going after you. Yeah. And you don't have to explain yourself to me because you're not here to serve me. I'm here to serve you. This is your world. It's not mine. And forgive me for living such an arrogant life. Like, this is just my world. I'm doing my thing. It's out. Whatever. I'm all about me. That's what we do. <laughs> We live like, we live with such an arrogance, like the breath in our lungs, it's ours. There has to be a spot in our life where we realize it's not ours, it's His. Because what that will do, that understanding, is that it causes us to, to get over things when people make us mad. It causes us to move past hardships. It causes us to move through difficulties and to still come out and say, even if I don't understand, I still trust you. That's faith. And that's what He's called us to. And when we come under that understanding as a family, let's show you what it looks like. What can happen. Verse 3, Acts chapter 12, verse 3, it says, And because Herod, because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he arrested him, he put him into prison and he delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him out before the people after the Passover. I'm going to take a side, uh, a side track here because I want you to understand something. It's important for us to understand that when Herod had Peter arrested, he put him into prison and he handed him over to, to 16 soldiers. They're working. It's, it's these guys... They're working shift work, okay? These soldiers, they're on shift work. So there's four of them, and they have four different shifts. And what, what their job is, is you 16 guys, four at a time, you guard this guy, you make sure nothing happens to him. So they're called to work four different shifts to guard him and to watch him. As he is in prison, and he's in prison... It's important for us to see this side note. We have to factor this whole thing in. He's in prison because it's the Passover. It's during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so I don't think we really understand that. And if you don't really understand that, you miss out on a lot of, on a lot of the story. So I want to back up into Exodus. And I want to show you what the Passover, just really quickly, is all about. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. It says, On the tenth of the month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Every household is supposed to take their own lamb on this tenth day of the month. Go down to verse 6. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it and at twilight and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh. They have to eat the flesh of the lamb. On unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Verse 11. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist and sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike at and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beasts. 
And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague will not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by, by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat the unleavened bread. So when Herod had arrested Peter and put him in prison, it just so happened, probably coincidentally, it wasn't coincidentally, it so happened that it was on the Passover. So he was to be kept in prison for seven days. But it's important for you to see what the Passover is because I want you to recognize something. This is going to get pretty intrusive, so still love me. I want you to recognize this is generations Years, lifetimes away here where Herod is when he's got Peter in prison from where the Passover originated. And yet they still understood it. And they still kept it in front of them. They understood the Passover. They understood what the blood of the Lamb did. And they continued even though they weren't following God, even though they weren't pursuing to be in the heart of God, they still continued to, uh, they recognized the Passover and they kept it in front of them. If they recognized the blood of the Lamb, of a Lamb, for so many generations and they kept it in front of them, what do you expect God's calling you and I to do with the blood of Jesus? And I wonder if the blood of Jesus has affected you that deeply that you remember it. You remember it in your days. You remember it in, in your school experiences. You remember it at work. You remember, do you factor the blood of the land into your marriages? Do you factor what happened, what has been provided for you in the blood of the land and the lives that you live? These people remembered the blood of the Lamb for generations. And I say to you, I think the church has not recognized the value of the blood of the Lamb near on the same level as these people did. And it's impossible for us to move in the things that God has called us to move in if we don't recognize the value of the blood of the Lamb. Doesn't matter what we face. Doesn't matter how troubled I get. There should come a time in Mike's life that he goes, dang it, stop bugging me. Man, either toughen up and be the man to lead us, or shut up and move on. Not gonna happen. But it's the blood. <laughs> when do I get it? When do we get it? When do we get that the blood is big enough? Because see, even back then in Exodus, they were told, whenever you eat of this flesh, whenever you eat of this flesh, you listening? When you eat of this flesh, the calling, the tip, what they told them to do in Exodus, when you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you better have your belt on, you better have your shoes on, you better be ready, you better understand that as you take this in, you better be living life in haste, ready to meet your Savior face to face. That's supposed to be taken in and, and stirring something on the inside of us that causes us to live a life that says, I'm ready to meet you today. I'm ready to meet you every day when we wake up. I'm ready, Lord. I'm going to live today on account of you because I'm going to factor the blood of the Lamb into my day. I'm going to live this day on, on purpose. That's what these people did. I, I'm telling you, we're missing this. Not hammering us and just being real. We're missing this. Let me show you why. Because this is what it's supposed to look like. So, so he, Herod had him arrested. He had him in prison. And, and it all comes to the whole key, the whole point of everything, the whole point of this message, the whole point of, of life for the church is right here in verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison. 
but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. I'm going to tell you something. It's one thing to be, a part of, uh, to be a part of a cool congregation. It's a whole other thing to be a part of a church that prays. There will be a confidence rise up in you when you can learn to be a part of a body of Christ that prays that you cannot have without that. I will say to you as a church, until we become a body of people that sometimes we meet together and we just say, hey man, we got to push the chairs out of the way. How about we just get on our face before our king and we pray until we see something happen. Until we become that kind of people, we will not, we will not walk in the things that God has provided for us to walk in. We won't. And God will just be a cool thing that we get to go and check out, but moving in what he wants us to move in, you will not as an individual, you will not as a church ever move in the power of God if you are not saturated in prayer. Won't work. Won't work. Every failure that we experience as a body, every failure that you experience in your family, every failure you experience in your, your relationships, your work, whatever it is, listen to me. I know that this is heavy. I know it is, but listen. Every failure that we experience is a lack of prayer. We, we don't pray like these people. Let me show you. They pray for church. They pray for Peter. The, there was constant prayer offered by the church. So look at verse 6. When Herod was about to bring him out, the night before Peter was, the night before Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Listen, my wife can't even sleep if she loses one of her five or six or ten pillows. <laughs> This guy's about to. He's on death row. He's 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 five six hours away from very literally having his head taken off of his body. He's bound with two chains, bound to a to a mud cot in a in a dungeon in a prison with two guards standing right in front of him and then two more guards standing at the door. He's bound in chains in a dungeon. And the Bible says he was sleeping. It's important for us to understand how he was sleeping. Look at verse 7. No, no, no. Back up. Verse, uh, yeah, yeah, verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. You see, it's hard for us to grasp this because we know what it is to turn the lights on. We've all done it. Every one of us have stood in a dark room and, and felt the light switch and turned it on. I've turned it off. I, I probably should. I'm just going to tell them real quick. <laughs> I used to be a transporter when my wife and I got married. I was a transporter in the hospital. I was the biggest knucklehead you've ever laid eyes on. And we had this person that died in the operating room, and they told me to take this person's body down to the morgue. That was probably not a good call on their part. <laughs> I'm, here I am. I, like, 19 years old, freaked smooth out of my shoes, pushing this body like, you know, get into the morgue, and we get to the morgue, and I know they usually don't do autopsies, so I don't know what the deal was, but when I get into the morgue, I open the door, and there's a big curtain drawn, and I, I wasn't used to being in the morgue in the first place, so like, I'm freaked out anyway, so I see this curtain, and I, I don't think much of it, but I will this dead guy or girl, don't know, didn't want to know. Up to this, to the big locker, I open the locker up. Never even been in there. I shouldn't have been doing this. <laughs> Push this person into this deal and, and sliding them in. And as I get them in, I'm closing this locker door. And I look and I've come to the end of the curtains. And as I'm closing the door, I look over and here is a gruesome sight. 
there's three or four doctors, I guess, standing around this person and they're doing an autopsy right there in front of me. It's rough. My knees started to melt. And as my knees started to melt, I grabbed the wall behind me. And I'm, I'm like, I gotta get out. I panic has set into me. So I'm heading for the door, sliding, literally sliding my hands down the wall. I get to the door and turn to go out. And as I turn to go out, guess what? My hand slides down. The light switch. I shut the lights off as I walked out. I heard the most profane things I've ever heard coming out of there. And instead of going back and correcting the mistake I made, I ran the I left those jokers elbow deep inside this person in the dark. That has nothing to do with my message. But it was funny. We know a light switch. We know what lights coming off and on look like. I, I, I've stood in, I've stood under lights. These lights, they don't, they don't grab my attention because I've seen them on before. That wasn't the case in Peter's time. There was no GE or GE one e. I guess I was on a roll. No, no light switch, and he's asleep bound with chains, standing between these guards, when a light shone in, oh, it says a light shone in the cell. A light shone in a cell of which there was no light. You think about your sleep. If you're asleep in the dark, would it, would it awaken you if the lights came on when you weren't expecting it? How much more when the lights came on when there were no lights? <laughs> the, a light shone in the cell, and it says, and he struck Peter on the side. He struck Peter on the side, and then it says, he struck Peter on the side, and then he raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And the chains fell off of his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself, put your clothes on, get dressed. So he tells him, Gird himself. Now he says, Tie on your sandals, and he did so. And then he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. Literally. There's no lights. This angel shows up. Whew, all of a sudden, this bright light is shining up here. Still asleep. The angel had to strike him on the side. Still asleep. The angel had to set him up. Slap him around a little bit. Say, hey, wake up. The chains have now fallen off of his hands. Peter still is asleep. The angel has to walk him through every article of clothing that Peter has to get dressed. And he's telling him, you've got to hurry. Get dressed. Put that on. Put that on. Put that on. Put your coat around you. Let's go. Get ready. So he walks him through the whole thing. Look what he goes on to say. Verse 9. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. I'm going to tell you, I promise you there are people in this room that don't sleep as soundly as Peter was that night on a mud cot, chained to the walls, standing between two, two guards, two more at the door. Lights came on, all of this stuff happens, and Peter thinks that he's dreaming. He doesn't even realize that what's happening is real. I want you to understand, more than I want you to understand, God wants you to understand this. More than the mud cop that Peter was laying on, the reason Peter was so soundly asleep on the night that he's a, hours before he's about to have his head taken off, he is soundly asleep because he's resting on the prayers of a faithful church. You shouldn't be able to sleep when you're about to have your head taken off. You shouldn't be able to sleep on a mud cop. You shouldn't be able to sleep when you're bound with chains. You shouldn't be able to sleep when two mean grown men are standing there looking at you. You should. He has every reason in the world to not be able to sleep. And he's so soundly asleep that all this stuff happens and he thinks he's dreaming. The reason that's important for us to understand is because the body of Christ can't sleep because we're worried about our bills, we're worried about our relationships, we're stressed out by all of these things. 
and we don't even know how to rest. I submit to you that's because there's no prayer for you. Peter was asleep on the prayers of the church. Look how it goes on even more detail. He says, so, uh, so he followed him, did not know what all was done was real, but thought he would see the vision. Verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to an iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. They walked past the first they walk past the first two guards, walk past the second two guards, come to an iron door that's not supposed to open. The purpose of the iron door is to stay closed. The iron door has one purpose, to keep what's on the inside on the inside. They came to the iron door and it opened on its own accord. What does that mean? It means we don't have to understand how to pay off the bills. We don't have to understand how to finance a retirement home. We don't have to understand how to finance a children's home. We don't have to understand how to reach a thousand people in our community. We don't have to understand how to do it. What we have to understand how to do is pray. And whenever you come, whenever you pray, and you come to an iron door and you don't know what to do, you just trust and pray. And things that aren't supposed to open will open on their own. See, that's great news. That's way better news for me than it is for you. Because if the future of this church and if us attaining what God has destined us to attain depends on my wisdom, we're in trouble. But the promise of the Lord is, is it doesn't. It depends not on your wisdom, but it depends on your ability to pray. Do you believe prayer is big enough? If we, start, if we believe in prayer, like this church believed in prayer, when we come to Iron Doors, they'll open on their own. Look what it goes on to say. They went out, went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And then this wraps it all up right here. And then, when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all of the ex ex uh, expectation of the Jewish people. Peter didn't even realize he had to get out of the dungeon, away from the guards, past the iron gate, and a city block down the road. And then he's like, ah, you saved me, didn't you? <laughs> you can't pull nothing over on me. I see what you're doing. Because, why? Because he was that sound asleep. And I want to say to you this. When this group of people understands family, like that group of people understood family, doesn't matter whatever it is you're facing, whatever it is that's robbing you of your sleep, we, we should be able to overcome it. And as soon as we start learning to sleep on the prayers of our family, we'll be able to sleep through anything. We'll be able to sleep through anything. Look what, look what happens. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose, shirt, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Let me just ask you. If you, if you had just overcome something that you needed to overcome desperately bad in the middle of the night, do you belong to a body of believers that at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning would be on their face for you? As soon as we start believing in God that much, we'll start seeing iron gates open up that shouldn't open up. Everything that limits us will be pulled off of us as soon as we start believing that God is who He says He is. You see, what we do right now is we say we're people of faith. We say we're people of prayer. But my question is, who's praying? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a condemning thing. It's not condemnation. It's conviction. What could we be having if we were people that prayed? You go on and read the rest of the story for yourself. It's an amazing story. Peter gets out and he goes and he knocks on the door where people are on their face praying. A, Rhoda, a servant named Rhoda, she comes to the door. She's so freaked out that she sees Peter at the door that she's like, Holy mackerel! Peter's standing at the door. She runs back in. She's like, Hey! 
Peter stood at the door and they're like, leave us alone. God said Peter. No, Peter's at the door. God said Peter. They're trying to yell over her. She's yelling at them. No, he's outside. They tell her, they tell her, you've just seen his spirit. They're just trying to be, they're probably a charismatic church, so they were being a little, you know, they're trying to go around some charismatic terminology. They're like, it's okay, you've seen his spirit. Good job, way to go, Rhoda. Back to prayer. <laughs> She's like, seriously, no, he's outside. So finally they come. They go outside. Remember, Peter's one block away from the prison that he just escaped from. It says they come outside. They all start jumping up and down, celebrating, probably banging tambourines. They were dancing and yelling, Peter! It says that Peter's holding up his hand. He's, he's, he's telling him with his hand, shh. That's the prison I just escaped from, guys. Celebrate inside. And then he's like, go and tell the boys. Now, I want you to see one last thing. I'll wrap it up with this. Peter says, go back and tell the guys what's happened. Look at verse 17. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Peter didn't even know what had happened to James. So what I'm saying to you is this. We serve a God who's going to get you out of any prison that you're in. But you have to recognize that sometimes, sometimes there's some Jameses in our life that don't make sense to us. But the Jameses are given to us so that we keep God in His proper place. Why if He doesn't do what we think He should do? Do we still serve Him? What do we do whenever it comes time to pray like that? Because one thing I can tell you, again, I'm, I, I love us. I don't want to hurt us. But this church didn't have a potluck understanding of what prayer was. They believed that prayer opened to prison doors. It wasn't like they were sitting at home, like the guys were sitting at home in the easy chair watching TV, like... I know it's prayer meeting time for Peter, but the game's on. Just put the car in the garage and pretend like we're not home. I, I know there's part of that that I'm being funny, but there's truth in that. When do we let God invade our lives? When do we let God become inconvenient to us because we're busy? And I wonder, are we really that busy or maybe are we just that distracted? And if it's that we're just that distracted. I wonder who it is that's causing the distraction. It's going to have to be a point in our lives where we go, Lord, I'm all in. I'm all in. Whenever I was reading these passages, I came across, I was a, there's, a, there's a commentary, I mean, it's called the Matthew Henry Bible Commentary. It's a, it's a tremendous commentary. Matthew Henry says this, I'll close with this. Listen to this. Please don't listen to this. Matthew Henry says at the bottom of his commentary from Acts chapter 12, he says this. We that live in a cold, prayerless generation can hardly form an idea of the earnestness of these men, these holy men of old. But if the Lord should bring on the church an awful persecution like this one of Herod, the faithful in Christ would learn what soul-felt prayer is. I, I don't want to go through that persecution. But I say to you, in the, you have to come to the realization that even if it requires my life, it's worth it. You have to come to the realization that God, I want, I want, I don't want to, I don't want to have a casual relationship with you. I want you to do what you want to do in my life, in my church. And I realize that I'm opening myself up to even let you be inconvenient for me sometimes. I have to come to that, I have to come to that realization, that belief. That we're willing to let him inconvenience us to become a people of prayer.
So Father, as we come before your prayer today, I realize that this message is, uh, I mean, man, Jesus, I, I wish that there were easier ways. I wish there were easier ways for us to to meet together. I wish I wish we could just I wish it could just be easy all the time. And Lord, please hear my prayer. I do not want us to have to go through persecution like this church did. Because they yes, they got to celebrate the fact that Peter got out, but they still had a funeral to do. They still had to bury James. Lord, have, have we truly allowed the blessing that you've given us, the blessing that we're so free that we can, I mean, in our arrogance, we can decide on Sunday morning if we want to get up and go to church or maybe we don't. Have we become so, so saturated, so drowning in the blessings that you've provided for us that we have, mm, we're not so sure that we want to really do things your way. That's, that's an incredibly arrogant lifestyle. And Father, I don't want us to have to go through persecution in order for the people of faith to rise up. I don't want that. But I do want your will. So Father, I say what, whatever that means, whatever it takes, I ask you to protect us. I ask you to keep the, the good things in front of us. Help us to remember that you're here to, to bless us, not to hurt us. That you have, you have great intentions in store for all of us. But help us to realize that, that you don't always have to fit in our understanding. Help us to become. God, I, I say it. I, I'm, I'm not scared, but I am cautious. I ask you. Father, that is an iron door that I recognize as a pastor of this church. How do we become a people of prayer? That's an iron door that I don't know how to answer. But I trust you that you do. Teach us how to become a people of prayer. Show us how to be what you've called us to be. So Lord, as we close out this service, we worship, we celebrate you. As we come and we take this bread and we drink this cup, I say to every person in this room, make sure that your belt is on and that you're ready to go. Take this today with haste, recognizing that today matters to God. Recognizing that there is a calling in our lives. Recognizing that there is a plan and that it won't happen unless we become a people of prayer. And if there is something that we can pray for you about, can I uh, just finish being a bit blunt enough? Maybe we just carry it one step farther. Let's stop being a prayerless people. If you need prayer for something, let's pray. Let's pray. We close out this service. We're going to give you time to take communion. But the elders and, and anybody else that wants to, you come up here and you be here and be ready to pray for somebody. If you need prayer for something, stop being, stop being so arrogant and thinking that it's just going to be okay. Let's pray. Let's become a people of prayer today. God teaches to pray.